Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com. I am Mike Casaza. Welcoming in Chris Anderson, a very judicious person, if I may. Already poking fun of me. Getting Congratulations. Getting my... Your civic duty fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, getting my jury summons. I thought I was getting out of it. Uh, got For those who don't know, I got sent a jury summons. But it had somebody else's address. Obviously, Chris Anderson, a very common name. So I thought they screwed up and it was the other guy. They screwed up and it was me. Uh, so maybe on some kind of boring jury duty. It's it's you know, it's not grand jury duty or whatever, but it's it's something I'll get my. Twenty five dollars in a sandwich, I suppose. Hmm. I'm uh, slightly older than you. Um and, and apparently Morgantown is extremely dangerous. Lots of crime. I don't know if you've heard. Yeah. Um, I've never once been summoned for jury duty. This is my first time. Knock on wood here. Because yeah. I heard it's brutal sometimes, too. I am not looking forward to it. The only person I know who has not complained about it is my father-in-law, and that seems right up his alley. Oh. Do you have you a plan like to get it? out of it? Or are you, like, you going to go with an open mind and, you know, maybe I like this case? Well, the, the good news is they give you a window. Like, hey, you got to do it is between you're going to get summoned at some point between was it may 8th and july 8th and i'm just going to tell them i have to travel for work for all of june which i do i gotta be up there for camps and i already got some vacation plans so and paid for and you put that in they'll probably look at it and be like ah that guy's annoying forget it and just move on mm. or you just be like how do i spell guilty <laughs> <laughs> see what they say um Guilty ass charge, West Virginia basketball active in the transfer portal have now added a second player, uh, Joe Toussaint from Iowa. West Virginia has uh, a point guard and, and maybe a bit of a throwback player in that he's kind of a ball dominant. New York City wants to get to the basket point guard and is not a guy they're going to teach to play the one or a guy who was a two in junior college and can play the one here. Uh, Joe Toussaint is a point guard. This is two guards from the portal. Major college experience, and also notably, two people who had some interest for sure, who only took one visit. It was to West Virginia and nowhere else. Uh, Eric Stevens and canceled a visit to Auburn, which was the number one team in the country last year. And Toussaint never set up another visit. And I mean, he, he's wanted to come to West Virginia for a while, but we've talked about Stevens. And um, what do we think about Toussaint? Uh, Hard nosed guard, like you said, from New York City, and and there's a lot been a lot of talk the last few years about how hey, you know, when West Virginia was good and they played hard nosed defense and stuff. I mean, obviously Javon Carter was not, but looking back at the early years of Bob Huggins, it was a lot of New York guys, a lot of New York City guys. I don't know if that played into it, but he seems like one of those guys that that loves to play defense. And it's interesting getting a perspective from Iowa fans. You always want to kind of listen in to hear what they have to say, take it with a grain of salt, but they were mixed. Some guys like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, he's a bench guy that didn't do a whole lot, which is true. Yeah, he played about 17 minutes a game, averaged four points. But a lot of people were saying, a lot of the fans were saying, hey, but he also, when he got on the court, he played really well. Tough defense, could, a guy that could have and maybe should have done more. He might be somebody who could step up once given a bigger role. So uh, it, it's it's always one of those things you want to listen to what the other fans have to say. And, and I thought those were some interesting takes. Six foot, two seasons left. You can't keep Kedrian Johnson forever. Um, and you don't have to worry about necessarily playing Josiah Davis next year. You know, they didn't play Kobe Johnson a lot this year, and he was supposedly a point guard. Um, maybe you can get by with Kedrian Johnson and Tucson and Kobe Johnson. You don't have to worry about another one here. It doesn't put a lot of pressure on Josiah Davis. That helps. You kind of have to squint here and look hard at this one because the numbers are not impressive from – what you would think about a, a player that they prioritize in the portal and they went all out on him. We have a story up on ear sports about what they did, the contact they had, the pitches they made from when he was here um, and, and kind of how they said, listen, we're going to let you be you because talking to him and I did talk to Tucson um, at a very odd hour <laughs> as it was, but didn't have a problem with the way he was made to play at Iowa. They won a lot. He was on some very good offensive teams and he was a part of it, played different roles, didn't put his head down and, and pout about anything he just played and did what they wanted him to do but he thinks that underneath all that is somebody who can score and who can distribute because that's what he did in high school when he was a top five top six player in the state um not too long ago 
But now he's learned how to really play that point guard position. He's not bitter about it. He's kind of grateful for it. You know, you humble yourself a little bit and you learn what's it like to start in the Big Ten. What's it like to come off the bench? What's it like to throw it to Lucas Garza? What's it like to to throw it to – I'm blanking now. Who was the player on the team this year? Consensus All-American. The big oh, guy? Uh, at Iowa, yeah. Uh, yeah embarrassing. I, I, wait, embarrassing for, I mean, am I supposed to be keeping up with Iowa basketball? Yeah, well, anyways, <laughs> a big guy like Garza, a consensus All-American. Like Keegan guard. Murray. Keegan Murray, uh, a that's all American, like wing guard player. And he, he played with both of them. So he understands how to get the ball inside when your offense goes that way. He understands how to get a guard going. He played with, uh, you know, Bohanna McCaffrey, guys like that. He's pretty well rounded. And now he's ready to kind of go out on his own a little bit, not be the guy, but to take what he was in high school and maybe what he thought he'd be in college, combine that with what he's learned in college, which is a little bit different, but maybe better for him, he thinks and then give it a run in a major conference against a team that needs him and wants him and is going to put him in position to maybe start, certainly play a lot of minutes, and ask him to score and distribute the ball. Um, I don't think that they're bringing in a one who's going to replicate what they did last year or the year before when they've struggled at the point guard position. I think this is um, this is probably a guy who, who's going to be maybe more Malik Curry than than a distributor, but certainly somebody who can distribute it and do some Malik Curry things. So this was discussed on our message board before uh, like before he committed, but when it was talked about him coming up for a trip. And I said I had some reservations about this approach. And, and the approach I'm talking about is Stevenson, Toussaint, and Keity Johnson, essentially, as your kind of backcourt, uh, your starting backcourt. I mean, Kobe, Kobe Johnson and um, Seth Wilson, again, we don't know too much about them yet. But uh, so I'm I'm focusing on these three three guys that we have seen play significant minutes in college and high major basketball, and all three of them. I mean, I, I ran out the stats to see we're, we're you're trying to fix a an offensive problem here. You're trying to fix scoring problem at West Virginia, and Keedy Johnson 5.3 points shooting 24% from three. Eric Stevenson he did score 11 points per game last year, but shot 37% from the floor. Not not from three, on the floor. Uh, Toussaint, 4.3 points per game last year, also shot 26% from three. So are they really lighting it up? But, but forever the optimist I am, I went back and tried to find the bright spot, tried to find some other angle to look at this, and, and it's related to what you were talking about with Toussaint and why he's coming here and what he thinks he can do. And you look at these three guys. Toussaint, Stevenson, Keedy. They've all scored before. Mm-hmm. It's not like they, they've they never never been able to do it. Uh, Keedy, well-known for West Virginia fans, obviously, since they recruited him. He averaged almost 26 points a game, one of the tops in junior college, right before he came when he was at uh, was Temple College down in Texas. Um, went back and looked. Stevenson averaged 25 points per game his senior year, set a state tournament record by averaging almost 30 points per game in four uh, four tournament games, made 13 threes, also a state tournament record, holds his school scoring mark for a single game, single season, and career. And then Tucson, the all-time leading scorer at his high school mm-hmm. in New York City, 23 points per game as a senior. Like, these guys have done it before. They have it in them. So there is hope that it, at least some of that comes back because West Virginia needs some kind of you know, creativity, some some ability to score from the point guard slash shooting guard position. And if, if he's good at getting in the paint, speaking of Tucson, of course, or getting by defenders and getting things open, that's great for a guy like Stevenson. Um, Stevenson had the most assists on his team last year at South Carolina. He can't pass it to himself, right? Um, he was creating a lot and doing a lot of things on his own because he had to get shots and he wasn't getting looks from people too. So if he's the guy who maybe didn't shoot the greatest percentage, perhaps he wasn't cast properly. If he's the guy who can float around picks, who can shoot over smaller defenders because of a matchup and he gets the ball in a good spot. If he can stand in the corner or stand up top, get in his sweet spot and catch a pass from somebody, he's probably going to shoot a better percentage. And if Tucson can do that, you're fine. Tucson's fast, can go with either hand, he says, um, likes to get downhill and just that, that New York city guard, um, it doesn't guarantee success for them, but it does It does kind of fit what they want to do. And you got to trust that their evaluation is right here and their projection is right. 
uh, for both these guys, but certainly here because he doesn't have the the offensive ammunition that you would think what they're looking for, but also don't think that they're done yet. Um, maybe not in the backcourt, certainly not in the wing, but they do have some things that are going on here too. Um, let's talk about who isn't coming. Jake Stevens from Panhandle, right? Muscleman, correct? Yeah. Was supposed to visit, I believe, next weekend. Um, I don't know that he was ever going to be a fit here or wanted to do this or they wanted him to do this, but you, you definitely have to have the conversation. They were planning on doing it um, over the weekend at some point, Saturday, Sunday. He informed West Virginia, thank you, but no thank you. I'm going to go in a different direction. And perhaps not surprisingly, he ends up at Chattanooga with his former coach from VMI, who was the new coach at Chattanooga. Um, six degrees of college basketball here. The Chattanooga coach is now the head coach of South Carolina. Could be coaching Eric Stevens and is not. But anyways, um, VMI coach moved to the mocks and Stevens will follow. Uh, bummer, surprise, whatever you want to call it. Who knows? But not going to happen. They got a pretty good plan B if uh, Nomad Orchier, the Sunbelt Conference Player of the Year, does indeed follow through. He intends to visit sometime before the end of the month here. Um, this is a big time addition that they get him. This is a guy who... I'm not sure you can project double-double in the Big 12, but certainly knows how to go about his business and get points and rebounds in a pretty good volume. Athletic guy, maybe a little bit undersized, 6'7". What can he do in the Big 12 that he was doing in the Sun Belt? Who knows, but there's a lot to work with there with him. Yeah, I think uh, we're doing so many podcasts, I can't really pick how long ago it was we did this, but I mentioned the top target for me would have been Johnny Broom because he was that versatile big man slash forward that, Scored points, grabbed rebounds. Omrie is a slightly shorter version of that. Um, he's not as quite as big as Broom, but he averaged 18 points and 12 rebounds last year. And he was technically just a freshman because his first season you know, didn't count towards his eligibility. So he still has three years of eligibility remaining, which, you know, with the transfer portal and how, how much every team is relying on him, it's not necessity to, quote unquote, even out the recruiting classes, but it sure would be nice not to have to get eight transfers every single year. So getting a guy that that is good and ready and has multiple years of eligibility left, that that's a positive. Freshman of the year, one year, player of the year, the next. Um, interesting guy. And again, that, that kind of fits the Huggins thing. You know, you don't get big, huge guys under the basket, but they like guys who can do some things. He can do it. Um, nor Chad, Omie, not Nomad. What did I say? Whatever I said, I know it wasn't right, nor Chad Omie, but they'd like to get him on campus. They can do that, and they get him. That's big. Uh, Chris, would you like to guess the school that is probably going to be a thorn in West Virginia's side on this one if it happens? Okay. I, enlighten me. Miami. <laughs> and Coach Adai is just not going to let it go, huh? I have no comment on that. <laughs> I think, but he's, I believe he prepped down there. He's from Nicaragua. Yeah. Pretty sure he's from Nicaragua. Um, yes, he is from Nicaragua and prepped down in Miami. So perhaps there's a homecoming. Um, you could do worse than what Miami's got going there right now, too. So hey, we'll see. But getting him on campus is a big one. Other option as they continue to do this. I think Broom is probably not going to happen. He has some major attention, which is expected. But they've been in contact again, trying to do it, make it happen. Uh, another one, and you know more about this one than me. This coming weekend, junior college big Jimmy Bell will be here. What do we think about him? Uh Big guy. I don't I, I don't want to at this point get into the ah, this guy's ahead of this guy on the board or got to wait and see what happens with this guy kind of thing. But, um, you know, th they did have Wagyu, Mohammed Wagyu up on campus. Was it a couple weeks ago? Who was another junior college big and given all of their attention on transfers as well. I have to think that there's one spot basically for a junior college big at this point, not two. So. For me, it seems like it might come down to Bell or Wagyu, and and Bell, Bell is a big dude, a big dude. He actually is, if you go back to the for his first appearance on our network, on the 24-7 Sports Network, he was an offensive tackle for football. And there was, I reached out to one of the guys that covers that area, and I asked him about him. I said, do you remember him as a, as a football player? said it ended quickly because he essentially just got too tall to play tackle. Uh, you know, you, you want that tackle to be 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Once you get to 6'8", 6'9", 6'10", too big. Uh, just usually don't have the footwork to get that done. And he and he is a huge dude. He he has slimmed down some 
from what he was, but he is still a lot thicker and bigger than some of these other uh, centers and forwards that we're talking about here. Let's keep an eye on April 18. That's the signing period, correct? Right. That A Federico is not signed yet. Nope. Because he can't. But if he signs on Monday, that seems significant. And maybe it's not a surprise. I don't know. I'm not projecting anything here. But also if he but, doesn't sign. Well, hold on. Let me have it April 13th. Not 13th. 18th. 13th. Oh, I it, was 18th. It, it, it ends May 18th. Okay. So Wednesday. Right. So we'll know soon. If he does not sign, well, how about this? If he's not signed on the 18th, we probably have our answer, right? Yes. Uh, I can't read my handwriting here. That three may very well be an eight, or that eight may very well be a three. Um, probably should type more. But if he doesn't sign, we may have some answers here. Because you're right. There's not there's not a lot of there's not a lot of room. So if you're thinking in your head here, how are they going to get to 13? You're adding Toussaint. You're adding Stevens. You've already added Pat Sumnick, Josiah Davis, Josiah Harris. How many spots are we talking about here? Not many, right? So that's why these next couple of days are important, too. And don't forget, too, um, with the eligibility being immediate now, it's not a free-for-all. You have to be in the portal this month. Um, May 1st, they kind of put a brick wall in where you are not guaranteed immediate eligibility if you're not in the portal by May 1st. So kind of have to make up your mind here sooner or later. You could be in the portal and not out of school. You don't have to make up your mind to go somewhere, but – that's kind of one of those safeguards that they put in for schools. And I know people talk about having periods and this and that probably the best they can do right now until they do something better. But May 1st is kind of a, a line in the sand, um, which, which could work against people. It could work for people who knows, but these next three weeks are going to be really busy and really important for what West Virginia does and, and who wants to be with, or maybe not even with West Virginia. Yeah, this is, when did they input that by the way, the, the, the May 1st window? Cause was that in place last year? Well, this is the first time it's actually been into effect. This is the first okay. calendar year that it's actually existed. So they did it last year, but after May 1st. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Cause I, I was, cause last year, obviously that was a lot of the things were happening in April and still decisions about NBA draft and what could you do? Who could you get depending on what was happening with McBride and Culver and all that stuff. So uh, I think uh, I'm curious how big of an impact that is. Cause one it seems kind of late. Um, for for a win for you know the the final deadline like I would have like if I were a coach I'd like it a little earlier but um I just don't know how much of an impact it's going to have this season but I bet it is nice for coaches knowing that once you hit that May first date the likelihood of a player leaving your team is greatly diminished correct um Seth Wilson mm -hmm. James Oconquo mm -hmm. Jamel King Kobe Johnson Keydreen Johnson. That's five. Stevens is six. Tucson seven. Harris is eight. Davis is nine. Sumnick is ten. Federico's eleven. Two spots. Almost there, Chris. Or are we still kind of far away? Still kind of far away. I think so. You right? think, yeah. If you think there's only two spots, <laughs> what does it all say? I got a bridge to sell you. Uh, yeah, I would say it's going to take however many that they think it takes, because if they find someone they really like, um, you can have a conversation with somebody for sure. And I, I'd be I would be very surprised if every name that we just mentioned there is, is here. Let's shift to football, Chris. <laughs> You're quite a, quite a cliffhanger. Yeah, uh, because we have quite a cliffhanger from Friday, Saturday, Sunday. JT Daniels on campus at practice. Neil Brown tiptoed around it, wished the weather was better because they had important guests. He was talking, of course, about his father-in-law, he yep. said. Um, they put the quarterbacks under the crucible a little bit. Did not get a lot of Will Crowder because he's rolled an ankle. Garrett Green, Nico Marchio gets stretched out. Daniels is there watching. Brown has good things to say about the incumbent players. West Virginia probably feels it's in a good position with Daniels. It got him here. It's the last of his visits. Um I think it really does matter. It's not the best to get a guy last. Some people like to get him last, but if you can get him here and he's last, if he hasn't bailed on you after two, that means he's thinking. He's not convinced that the first one or two are for him, um, especially a guy like him who's been a high-level recruit, who's been a high-level transfer. I don't think he's going around just trying to get free rides and free hotel stays. He's probably interested in this. Um, had a lot of moles around town. Seemed like he had a good time at Oliverio's with Graham Harrell, Kelly Zinn, uh, who you pointed out. That's someone that... They sometimes throw the keys to and let her do the important stuff. 
She's also got a background in compliance. If you're a player who is interested in transferring and has some things that you need to know about, great to have her there. Obviously, Graham Harrell is the person you want to have at that t- at that tiny table in the corner. This makes sense. The issue is that West Virginia was pretty adamant they weren't going to add anybody before the end of the spring because they wanted to give their three quarterbacks a full go in the spring. We haven't seen anything on social media with, you know, let's goes or gifts or whatever. Um, maybe that's not a surprise, but I don't know how long Daniels wants to wait. He says that he's, he has said that he's going to hold out until after he graduates, but he still intends on leaving. Um, I don't know what or when we see something next. How do you feel this goes? Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't think it lasts until, cause I think yeah. before this date I heard for his spring semester was like May 17th or something like that. I don't think it's going to wait that long because in part there is, you know, the May semester kind of thing where you will see a lot of guys enroll in May. Now, I don't know if he'll be able to kind of dip out on Georgia until he's completely done. So maybe he's not getting there until later in May or even that first week of June. Actually, Memorial Day weekend is when, you know, all the quote unquote summer arrivals are getting there. So maybe he comes with those guys if he were to commit to West Virginia. But I imagine a decision will come before then because not that there's going to be too many people in there. But if you're JT Daniels, do you want to wait until after there's another rush of transfers? You kind of have your yeah. pick here. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that West Virginia or Oregon or Missouri or whoever else is going to be like, oh, hey, um, well, this other kid from, you know, third stringer from Tennessee just entered the transfer portal and we're kind of interested in him instead of you. Like, I don't think that's going to happen really with these schools, but I don't know if you want to wait and just have another rush of quarterbacks because you don't know who's going to jump into the transfer portal come the end of spring football. So I think – Within the next couple of weeks, he'll make a decision. I think he'll go home and think about it. Like you said, he he seems to be taking a methodical approach to this, looking at all of his options, evaluating the situations. And, and in these scenarios, continuing on your point about being first or last visit, that's always a debate when it comes to recruiting trips. And, and you never know. A lot of times I asked the coach one time and he told me it depends on the kid. And now you got Daniels, who I guess you can call a young man. And I think he's going to take a more methodical approach to it. He's going to go through all his visits. He wasn't going to visit the first school and commit on the spot. So you want to be last in those situations. With the younger kids, the high schoolers, maybe you do want to be first to try to just get them to commit. And then they just call off all their other trips and you got it in the bag, uh, so to speak. So um, I don't know. Interesting approach here. I have to like West Virginia's chances, especially getting that last visit, given their situation. Uh, and the connection with Harold. And you do this 10 times out of 10 too, right? Like I don't, yeah, no, I don't yeah, care. Like yeah, if you yeah, hurt yeah. anybody's feelings that's on the campus right now, you have to take a look at this and make it, make it, make it happen. Do everything you can to make it happen. If it doesn't, Hey, you'd rather fail trying. Yeah, absolutely. What was the, I am trying to give credit to where it's due, but I remember it was like four or five years ago. There's somebody who I believe worked for ESPN. Maybe it was like Bill Barnwell or somebody that said, there was a team that needed a quarterback and they had two first round picks. And he was like, I know this sounds crazy, but you draft two quarterbacks. And he went into a long argument about just how important it was to get the quarterback, which I think everybody's come to that realization. And in the NFL, obviously it's even more important because you get them on your rookie deal, but whatever the equivalent of that is holds true in college too. You just keep taking the best quarterbacks you can as many as you can until you get the right one. Yeah, and it, I don't know. I've I've heard a lot about him lately. That just seems like it's it's really good that he fits what Harold does, and that people wonder like, what if? You know, he's. I know we make a big deal out of all oh, these two have a great relationship. Actually, they don't. They played one game with each other, and then it became pretty clear that Slovis was the guy. But a lot of people that I've talked to, or people that I've talked to, have talked to, think that the what if there is is pretty juicy, and if there's a chance to do it again because they both realize it, player and coordinator, it might be hard to pass up too. He doesn't have that at Missouri. He doesn't have that. At Oregon State, he can go to either one of those. I really wonder if he wants to be in the SEC again. We'll see. Oregon State, kind of a sleeper in this, but I think you could look at West Virginia situation and say well, this is a little bit different, but it's also somewhat familiar too to him. Um, it's a possibility too. Hey, did you get any interesting DMs late last night from you? Maybe. <laughs> I got a couple from you. That's for sure. 
Um, well, what I should mean. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I know exactly which one you're talking about. I just I assume that was a private deal. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, listen, these are these are dots that you put together because this is what happens when when the the case is afoot, right? When something is up, um, and people start talking about stuff because you can. Um, it happens when West Virginia hires Graham Harrell, and all of a sudden Jackson Dart goes in the portal, and you say, "Wait a minute, is that going to happen?" Maybe, maybe not, but you can't have that conversation if you're West Virginia unless you have someone like Graham Harrell. You know what I mean? So Harrell is, I'm not saying he's a kingmaker, but he's a possibility maker, right? Um, Daniels is on campus. I think West Virginia really likes its chances. Um, have and have not debriefed enough people to say that I feel one way or the other, but I think that they probably think they did a really good job doing what they could. Um, the timing is right for them. And there, there's something about being third where you can figure out what happened on his other two visits. You could be different. You could be the same where you want to be, so on and so forth. I just think that they, they like their chances here. And again, it probably doesn't happen unless you have Harold. So Harold, at least in some regard, is doing his job. It'd be great if you closed one of these, but fine. Two five-star offensive linemen from Georgia went in the portal yesterday. Mm-hmm. Amarius Mims, Clay Webb. You can have these conversations now. I'm not. I'm well, not. Speaking of having, we're just going to casually drop this on, on the tail end of a of a podcast. That's a bomb. That's a bomb, Mike. Is that okay, boss? <laughs> I, I'm just saying this found its way to you because it found its way to me. Um, I don't listen. It just happened. They haven't said anything. They haven't put a, the graphic out of their top eight or five or whatever. But people put these things together because. It could happen. And I'm not sure that Daniels is there long enough to be great friends of two offensive linemen that aren't there anymore and maybe weren't in the best position to be there long term or whatever. Um, perhaps they end up going to Miami, too. Who knows? I have no comment on that. But these are the conversations you can have when you get the right pieces in place and things can happen pretty quickly once one falls into position. Um, and with Daniels, the thing is, if you can keep him safe and keep him upright. He's a pretty good player. Injuries are going to be a concern, obviously, for him, but that's the same with any quarterback, and every quarterback's better with protection. Can't do a whole lot better than adding one or two five-star guys who were groomed to play in the SEC and spent a year there. Yep, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the same as, as the quarterback spot, but, again, you got all five starters back on the offensive line, but you don't say no to two five-star kids. No, I mean, and you could project that the offensive line that may take the field that first, what, Thursday night? Thursday night mm -hmm. game, right? Mm -hmm. um, they could be back together again next year, which is crazy. But are you are you saying, thank you, but no thank you. These guys who are going to start our opener, they could be here again next year. Absolutely not. You don't shut that door. You open it up and you have that conversation. Um, and again, doesn't mean anything. Not a kingmaker, but the possibility certainly exists. Um, the quarterback's the pie piper. He really is. It doesn't matter. Um, you know. That's that's the guy that people do gravitate around to, and and if you get a good one, people want to play for him, protect him, play with him. You know, you got a chance to be good if you got the right quarterback. And who knows what happens with Daniels, and who knows what happens to these two offensive linemen? I'm just saying that if you get one piece, a lot of things can happen, and you can expand the way you think and the way you talk, which is why we're doing this at the very end of a Monday morning podcast. This has been quite the uh, not ten minute quick hitter podcast. This is this is a loaded. A loaded 30 minute podcast. It's a journey. It is a journey. This is a good one, though. This is a lot of information in here. We'll see. People are going to call us crazy. Uh, and you might be sending me an angry DM sometime soon, huh? Not me. Oh, Somebody okay. might. But okay. it won't be me. Well, plenty more to come. Keep it tuned at earsports.com. Anything to add, sir? No, that's it for me. I have plenty more to add, but I think I probably said too much. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Mike Casaza. And I'm Chris Anderson. We'll talk to you later.